Princess Anne. She may be the hardest working royal, but when it comes to her love life, she's far from a fairy tale princess. I'm not totally useless. I was quite well educated, one way or another. She said, I will marry the man I choose, no matter who he is or what he does. From intense press speculation. There was an awful lot of interest in who she was seeing and what this might mean for the monarchy. To a love triangle with the future queen. She doesn't seem concerned about etiquette from the palace's point of view. And public scandal for a very private princess. The ball? Very much. Never been mentioned. Mark was having an affair of his own. He fathered an illegitimate child. Tonight, royal experts and insiders reveal how Anne's seven love affairs show us what she's really like. In many ways, Anne was a trailblazer. Why did she choose these men? By his account, she was lonely and he provided that companionship. And despite lies, affairs and divorce... I have no comment to make on the news at all. How has Anne managed to keep her royal reputation intact? She is very shrewd. She knows how to keep information away from the press. Scandal, controversy and romance. These are the loves of Anne's life. Sir Timothy Lawrence is the man we are used to seeing by Princess Anne's side. Out of all the royals, Princess Anne does seem probably one of the happiest. Um, ha happily married, very settled, no drama, no impropriety. The marriage spans 28 years, and as this recently revealed cosy, candid photo shows, they're clearly still very happy together. I think a lot of people think that she's always been married to the same person. Anne may be in a stable relationship now, but it's been a long journey to get there. She had a rumoured seven relationships, each different from the last. Princess Anne's past is, to say the least, colourful. I mean, we know that she had seven boyfriends. She was the first royal child to divorce. She married a commoner. She just was rebellious. Some of the boyfriends were considered incredibly unsuitable. This story begins whilst she was still in her youth, and perhaps the world's most eligible princess. And when the press reported Anne's very first boyfriend, it seemed like a perfect royal match. Gerald Ward was a friend of the royal family, a great friend of Prince Charles. He was regarded as suitable, if you like, by the palace. Educated at Eton, the family had uh, land in Wiltshire. But at 12 years older than 18-year-old Anne, what was it about Gerald that really attracted her to him? He was drawn to a good rider, a good horseman. Her love for horses was almost all-consuming um, when she was young. Her father said once, if it doesn't fart and eat hay, she's not interested. They were spotted together shortly after Princess Anne finished her A-levels at boarding school. So this really puts her at you know, the age of 18, really quite young, feeling out these new relationships and kind of figuring out who she was. It's no surprise that her romance with Gerald fizzled out quickly. I think Anne felt she was being sort of pushed slightly, nudged towards this eminently suitable character. And I think she was very young. He was a good bit older. He was too tweedy. It was clear from early on that the young, strong-minded princess wasn't willing to let social expectations dictate her romantic life. Anne was always clear. She said, I will marry the man I choose, no matter who he is or what he does. If you had not met a man whom you wanted to marry, do you think you would have married out of a sense of duty? No way. Um... <laughs> She'd led quite a sheltered life, and she needed to explore. She wanted to enjoy life. The romance was over quickly, but their connection didn't end there. Gerald marked the start of an unusual pattern Anne had with most of her ex-partners. Although their relationship did not last, she remained on very good terms with him, as did the rest of the family. Gerald actually ended up being one of Prince Harry's godparents. The fallout from Gerald showed Anne just how desperate the press were for stories about her love life. She was forced to come up with ways to keep her private life private. She resented the fact that the press would be interested in finding out who her boyfriends were. It also led to this sort of rather difficult relationship that she's had with the media over the years. She often came across as rather prickly, um, short-tempered. Of course, it, it 
and noted this struggle in a Parkinson interview, in typical comedic fashion. I regret what you say to them. I mean, the report that went around the world was you told one photographer to naff off, I think it was. <laughs> do you, do you uh, wish to retract your choice of words, or...? No, no, no. No, well, there was several of them, actually. <laughs> Telling the press to leave her alone didn't always work. They soon got wind of another love affair. As quickly as Anne had shrugged off Gerald Ward, she picked up boyfriend number two, who, unlike Gerald, was certainly not a conventional royal escort. The things that Sandy Harper did, the way he behaved, the way he dressed, um, that it set off alarm bells um, throughout the establishment because although he had this background which was vaguely acceptable, he dressed very much like a hippie. He had long hair, he wore, because she was at, she'd escaped the sort of tweedy world, which was still core to the royal family. After the eminently suitable Gerald Ward, Sandy was a breath of fresh air for the rebellious princess. Not a military man or an aristocrat, but a professional polo player whom she met through her love of horses. They were seen out at the discotheques that were springing up all over London in the late 60s and early 70s. I think one of the most striking things about it is that after an evening out, it was often Princess Anne who drove them home afterwards. She liked men who were fun, and she liked to be amused and entertained, people who were prepared to take a bit of a risk in their private life. The relationship told the world that Anne wasn't prepared to play by the royal rules. She was not a conventional princess, which she wryly admitted herself in the famous Parkinson interview. That didn't really fit the, somehow, the image that the media thought I ought to have. Um, I think, you know, princesses as you come in sort of fairy story, you know. That's, that's what they are, and uh, somehow I didn't fit. Luckily for the stuffier types at the palace, neither Sandy nor Anne saw a future in their wild romance. He was a bit of a self-confessed ladies' man. He did do an interview where he said, you know, I take a lot of girls out and, and the, the relationships don't work out. I think probably that was the most exciting time of her life, in a way, but she knew it couldn't last. So she knew it was almost like she was being allowed to play for a while before the serious business of being a grown-up royal had to begin. By age 20, speculation about Anne's love life was rife, and when rumoured boyfriend number three hit the headlines, it seemed Anne was open to becoming a grown-up royal. Richard Mead was another extremely accomplished horseman and in fact, one of our most decorated Olympians. His love of horses, that rivaled even hers, seems to have been a huge attraction for Anne. But unlike Sandy before him, Richard also had an understanding of her royal life. Mead was definitely part of that approved social set that it was OK for the royals to mix with because, you know, they knew his background, they knew his family. He was also quite discreet, which is obviously something that the royals really take quite seriously and she really wouldn't have been interested in someone that fawned over her and her royal status. But I think for her, the main thing would have been someone that could deal with her no-nonsense attitude. Richard seemed to be the favorite for the princess's hand. I think there was a lot more talk about Richard Mead as a potential husband for Anne than there had been hitherto about anyone else. But Anne's own father had his doubts. Richard Mead, who indeed was, an old, was a friend of mine. He was unfortunately 12 years older than the princess, age gap between the two, so he was discouraged. Anne was just 20, and Richard may have been just too grown up for the young princess. She seems to have listened to her father, and after less than two years, the pair parted ways. She was in no great hurry. Times had changed, she was not under pressure to marry. She didn't have to produce an heir to the throne. It gave her a degree of freedom that her brother never really had to enjoy. And um, she was determined to enjoy it. And if that meant dating one, two, three, four, five men before she married, then, then so be it. Richard Mead, he became quite a close friend. They could go on uh, horse events together and his children became very friendly with Prince William and Prince Harry. So she wasn't spiteful, she wasn't bitter. Next. Anne's most risky romance has been under wraps for years, involving a complicated love quadrangle. He would have been a complete no-no for the royal family. The story of Anne's most controversial relationship 
that sent shockwaves through the royal circle remains largely untold. By age 20, Anne had met rumoured boyfriend number four. Andrew Parker Bowles, I think, was a serious contender, a very distinguished army officer as well, and a very great favourite uh, of the Queen. And his relationship with the royal family goes back so far, he was actually in the procession at the Queen's coronation. I think she was very intrigued by him. He was a very suave, sophisticated figure, and much more experienced in the ways of the world than the men she'd hitherto been dating. But there was one slight problem. Anne wasn't the only woman Andrew was seducing. The name is familiar, of course, because he was dating a young woman called Camilla Shand, who became Camilla Parker Bowles and is now, of course, the wife of the Prince of Wales. But he was also seeing a lot of other women in his spare time. It was thought that when he cheated on Camilla with Princess Anne, that Camilla decided to get a bit of revenge and that was when she actually started up her own relationship with Prince Charles. Thus began Anne's best kept secret, a rumoured royal quadrangle involving the Queen's two eldest children. The relationship shows that for the determined forthright Anne, there was to be no settling in her pursuit of happiness, even for the sake of appearances. There's very much a sense of, well, if a guy can do it, why can't I with Princess Anne? She saw in Andrew Parker Bowles someone who was slightly dangerous, if you like, but also great fun. And I think it showed there was an element of that life and to see where that might lead her. This risky romance did not sit well with the palace. And perhaps, as with previous lovers, this was also part of the appeal. So I think even at this very early stage in Anne's life, we can really see her strong character coming through. She doesn't seem concerned about etiquette. From the palace's point of view, she's quite interested in men who are a bit different, who have got a little bit of a reputation. He would have been a complete no-no for the royal family. Apart from the promiscuity, the big issue with uh, Andrew Parker Bowles was that he was a Catholic. This is one detail that Anne would have to consider. For the pair to marry, Anne would likely have to withdraw from the line of succession. Princess Anne was never going to try and break that particular rule, but that worked in her favour, in a sense, because she wanted to have fun without the pressure to turn that fun into a sort of formal relationship or even marriage. As scandalous as the relationship may have been, once again, the notoriously private princess miraculously kept it under wraps from the public. When she and Charles would go to breakfast, they would voraciously scan the paper for any of the little tidbits that the papers had published about them. They wanted to know what they'd figured out, you know, had that relationship been kept secret. I think this revelation really has come about because of the Netflix show, The Crown. And I think a lot of people were quite shocked. I think a lot of people had to check on Google if this was actually true. How do you know all this? Because I was briefly caught up in it myself. Wait a minute. When? Then, in the past, it doesn't matter. It was all very straightforward. He got what he wanted, which was to make Camilla jealous. I got what I wanted, which was a bit of fun. Fun? Yes, sorry, Mummy, it was. The private conversations can still only be imagined, but the story of this extraordinary relationship was a revelation to most. She really was besotted with Andrew Parker Bowles. I think uh, after a couple of years of Anne really chasing him, she realised that, you know, he was only really going to make her unhappy. The press were getting more interested, and, of course, the long shadow cast by his Catholicism and his promiscuity. It's understood when Andrew was posted to Germany, it firmly put an end to things. But despite their complicated past, Anne has kept this ex especially close. Andrew is a godfather to Zara. He's remained a firm friend of Princess Anne's for the best part of 50 years. So no, I don't think there was any ill will um, on Anne's part towards his marriage for Camilla. After the dangerous liaison with Andrew, Anne once again sought out a quieter, less colourful partner. And again, she chose one. He was a member of the Queen's Dragoons. Of course, you know, another dashing cavalryman. It's easy to see what Anne saw in him. Another gold medal winning equestrian. A military man whose father worked for the royals. And no controversial reputation. Maybe she was looking for somebody who just made her feel safe and secure, reassured, a calm relationship where she knew that the gentleman was really interested. 
her because actually Andrew, having been quite the ladies' man, maybe didn't give her that stability. After the other difficult relationship she'd had, he must have seen seemed a godsend. They quickly hit it off. And then they were both at the 1972 Olympics. That's where the relationship really blossomed. Mark was different to Anne's previous boyfriends. He was a quiet character. Because we know she's very much like her father, who is quite a controlling character, Mark must have seemed a big improvement on people like Gerald Ward. The relationship would have been the man in the driving seat. With Mark, it was different. He was, he was quite shy. Royal biographer Brian Hoey has first-hand experience having met and interviewed Mark and Anne. The princess took control of the interview and I've known him ever since and he's a, he's a pretty good guy and you get him talking privately and he is very, very articulate, but he is not brilliant if you get him, you know, speaking publicly in, in television. When you were a teenager, did you have any idea of the sort of girl that you would like to marry? No, I, I, no, I didn't. I, I, I wasn't very clever with, with, with girls, I don't think, when I was a teenager. I, I definitely was a bit um, not very good. Not very successful, she said. After the princess's previous boyfriends, who enjoyed the limelight and matched strength, Mark seemed happy for Anne to take the lead. His background was very different to her. He was a commoner, he was the son of a sausage maker. You know, he didn't really have the airs and graces of somebody who had grew, grown up around royal circles, that, that confidence. Anne appeared to welcome this break from her usual aristocratic type. The new romance was quickly blossoming and, of course, instantly captured the attention of the world's media. Princess Anne was terrified. I don't think that's putting it too strongly, that her relationship with Mark Phillips would be discovered, would be exposed, would be written about in detail. And I think the reason for that was that she knew that he was the one. To avoid being discovered, she even admitted to hiding in Mark's horse box with her typically dry humour. It was an enjoyable experience being in a horse box, man. Well, I've been a much better driver of horses than ever since. You have. You have <laughs> some consideration. She was always quite happy to lie to keeping it secret and indeed keeping it away from people like ourselves. <laughs> I think it has, yes, it became rather a strain. Yeah. But the press finally got their story. The long months of rumour, speculation and denial were over. The Easter engagement was now public knowledge. Mark Phillips was the man who had finally tied down the Queen's only daughter. The royal family were thrilled at the engagement, so much so that the Queen Mother said that they were the Six months later, on the 14th of November, 1973, Anne became the first of Queen Elizabeth's four children to wed. The moment we've all been waiting for, and how lovely she looks. It was a spectacular at Westminster Abbey. These pre-internet days, still something like 500 million people plus watched the wedding. So uh, inevitably it started off with enormous enthusiasm. this great aisle and the congregation. All eyes are upon this couple. Both Anne and Mark were hugely private, but they instantly became one of the world's most famous couples. He was beginning a public life which he hadn't really countenanced for himself, but he sort of reconciled himself to the fact that he was marrying a woman he loved and he would just have to make the best of it. Such was their desire for privacy and normality. When Mark was offered an earldom from the Queen, he turned it down, as the newlyweds wanted their children to be free from royal constraints. Early married life appeared idyllic from the outside. The Queen, as a, a wedding present, had given Anne Gatcom Park, this magnificent house in Gloucestershire. I saw quite a lot of Anne and Mark during their, their early days of marriage. I thought they were perfectly suited. Apart from being a loving couple, they were good friends. Anne continued her riding career alongside her royal duties. Four years after the their first child, Peter, was welcomed into the family. But within a couple of years of Peter's birth, cracks were already beginning to show in the marriage. Both of them had left the world of show to devote herself to, to royal duties. I think they were very much in love, but he was in love with Anne, who was a horsewoman who shared his passion for riding. I don't really think he gave much thought to the other side of Princess Anne, someone who had a, 
full public life um, as a royal princess and where that meant he was going to fit in. Mark's ability to look past Anne's royal status seemed to have been an appeal for them both, but he now faced the reality of her role. Mark openly described public appearances with Anne as pure torture. He quickly absented himself from that. He, he didn't really want to become Anne's plus one on all her, her trips. It wasn't long before the clearly uneasy balance of power seemed to have caused a divide in the relationship. Perhaps when they got together, they were a better match. And as time went on and Anne grew in confidence and involved, perhaps she just outgrew him. I think after time, Mark wasn't really accepted by the rest of the family. They thought he was rather dull and he could only talk about horses. Rather cruelly, it's said that Prince Charles used to call him foggy in the sense that um, he was a bit wet and a bit thick. Soon, the strains in the relationship would become impossible to hide. And as they say, one thing led to another. And he said that they began an affair. If the first few years of Princess Anne and Mark Phillips' marriage had shown cracks, six years in, a chasm was appearing. As Mark diverged from his main equestrian career into creating his own business, making horses and jumps, and Anne, of course, was committed to royal schedule and diary, it seemed very much that they spent a lot of time apart. It was also beginning to be noted that um, Anne seemed to have grown very close to one of her bodyguards. 32-year-old Royal Protection Officer Peter Cross was a married father of two from Sheffield. His background, plain, northern, brought up in, in South Yorkshire, completely different from that of the princess, but I don't think that mattered that much. A strong action man, Cross was very unlike Mark Phillips, with whom Anne appeared to be growing tired. He was amenable, he wasn't a dominating kind of character. And what she was really looking for, she found in Peter Cross, who would have seemed exotic to her with his background. By his account, she was lonely. Phillips was, they say, one thing led to another. Um, and he said that they began an affair. They would chat a lot on the back stairs of Gatcombe House. And Mr Cross explains it, that they were sitting there one day chatting and he looked into her eyes and she looked into his eyes and they clasped hands and they kiss. Photographs of Peter Cross and Anne from his time as her protection officer hint at their close relationship. Cross and Princess Anne do seem incredibly comfortable in each other's company, overly familiar for the role they were in. You do get the impression that Anne was enjoying that attention, but also Cross was really quite distracted. He doesn't look like somebody who's there to protect her from a potential threat. He looks lost in the moment. He began to dress rather like the sort of tweedy, horsey people that Anne surrounded herself with. He wore tweed caps, moleskin trousers. He began to look the part. And so the rumor mill began to work. When it was suspected that they were having an affair, Peter Cross got removed from his position and sent away. And there's an interesting scene in The Crown where Anne and her mother have a conversation about it. You can't. Here's the one thing that makes me happy. You have so much to make you happy. Then how come none of it does? Of course, this drama surrounding the romance is imagined, but experts think it still had a big effect on Anne. He was obviously quite important to her at a time when her emotions were quite high. But allegedly, Anne wasn't about to give up on Cross that easily. Summoning him to Gatcombe Park after his dismissal, a day in the country became code for them meeting up. It is said that they still met from time to time and that Anne had a code word so that people wouldn't know it was her when she was telephoning and if she would say it was Mrs Wallace. Was this, we all wondered, a reference to Wallace Simpson, another rather notorious figure linked to past royal misbehaviour. What's quite interesting is that she's quite defiant about this relationship as well. She is a rebel, she isn't going to play by the rules, and even though he's been sent away, she still wants to see him, and she does. Peter Cross maintains he's stayed in touch with Anne for several years, 
And whilst Anne chose not to comment on these allegations publicly, she and Mark were forced to address questions about the state of their marriage during that revealing interview with Michael Parkinson for Network 10 in 1983. When Parkinson asks about the rumours, you see Princess Anne flinch ever so slightly. That suggests that she was afraid of what's coming. Um, she also instantly averts her gaze, looks downwards, and you do see her eyes in this moment. There have been rumours recently about divorce and happiness. Are they true or untrue? In <laughs> <laughs> uh, informed gossip has been uh, going on for years. One sort of another. You can really feel how awkward that was. But how do you react when you read these stories? I mean, what is your feeling? There was much of a, a pause before either she or Mark gave comments in, in response to that question. Um, <laughs> it's a difficult question to answer, and, the, the, um, and the, it, it depends. There's a moment where he starts speaking, you can sort of see her swallowing and just looking visibly uncomfortable. I think. To a large extent, you ignore them. But then if they start to persist and go on and on and on, then it starts to become a bit trying. You eventually feel that... He really didn't need to say anything. She'd left it in a good place, but then he comes in, he responds with that nervousness, and in explaining himself actually just makes them look guilty of hiding something and essentially kind of undoes what she says. The body language between them was absolutely terrible. They did not look like they even liked each other, let alone happily married together. After keeping quiet about the alleged affair at the time, in 1985, Peter Cross sold his story to the news of the world. He blurted out all the details of their intimacy and their closeness and the fact that she had taken a real shine to him. I interviewed Mark Phillips, and this was shortly after the scandal. He said, policemen, don't talk to me about bloody policemen. <laughs> She didn't like the idea that this relationship between his wife and, and a lowly policeman had been splashed all over the newspapers. Anne would have been mortified to have heard these stories shared about herself, whether they were true or not. You know, we only have Peter Cross's word for all of this. Anne has never uttered a scintilla of comment about it or not. Anne's ability to remain tight-lipped about her private life may be one of the reasons why she escaped this scandal pretty much unscathed. I think Anne didn't get a huge negative response from the public was because she didn't say anything. She didn't confirm it. She didn't deny it. She just got on with her daily life. She just didn't feel the need to actually address it because it was her private life that the public were not entitled to know about. I think the public's view was that this is just scandalous muckraking and they were prepared to uh, give the benefit of the doubt. Another reason Anne's reputation remained largely intact following these revelations, dip with Lady Diana. Once Diana arrived, Princess Anne was out of the picture. Here is this young, glamorous, shy, extraordinary young woman who we imagine was going to marry the heir to the throne after a very long time. It probably quite suited Anne in many ways that there was somebody to sort of deflect attention away from her. Rumours may have circulated about Anne during her marriage, but husband Mark Phillips was far from the innocent party. Mark was linked to a number of women throughout the course of his marriage. All of these affairs were denied, but nonetheless, he was followed around by these rumours for a large part of his marriage. Mark Phillips was leading a fairly, uh, how should I put it, a uh, rackety life. He was going around the world. He had all sorts of opportunities to misbehave. But one liaison which took place in New Zealand in 1984 was to become especially significant. Mark Phillips had an affair with a art teacher called Heather Tonkin in Auckland, and he met her at a riding clinic and took a shine to her, and they had a one-night stand. It is said that Mark Phillips left his boots outside his door to signal to Heather Tonkin which room he was staying in. This fling had serious consequences. Heather had fallen pregnant with Mark Phillips' secret love child. 
he tried to persuade her to have an abortion, which she wouldn't have. And then he denied that he was the daughter's father. It really was a huge potential scandal that the princess's husband had got this child on the other side of the world. But it would be another seven years before this news broke. The Daily Express revealed home footage of Heather with their daughter, appearing a world away from her royal relatives. First, a 1989 theft exposing another secret would push the marriage even closer to breaking point. Anne was having an affair while still married. He had echoes of the sort of practical action man that she'd found in Peter Cross, and I think that was very appealing. By 1989, Princess Anne's 16-year marriage to Captain Mark Phillips had been dogged by rumours of numerous infidelities on both sides, and the couple were now rarely seen in public together. Although still married, they were leading completely separate lives by then. Now a theft that Windsor Castle was about to spell the end of the marriage once and for all. But it would also allow Anne to finally settle with a man who'd make her truly happy. In 1989, a set of letters were actually handed to the Sun newspaper. They wouldn't publish their contents. Instead, they passed the letters on to Scotland Yard and an investigation was launched to figure out exactly how these letters had been taken. The Sun might not have published the letters, but they still got their story. Although the Sun newspaper hadn't published uh, the content of the letters, they, it was known that they were affectionate. They used terms like darling, so it would have set tongues wagging that there was potentially something going on. With the rumour mill swirling, in a surprise move a week later, it was the palace who named the author of these letters. This is the man now known to have written the stolen letters to the Princess Royal, Commander Timothy Lawrence, equerry to the Queen. They issued a statement, but they denied that there was any inappropriate relationship. They were trying to suggest it was entirely innocent, but the Queen's daughter and the Queen's equerry, as a rule, don't tend to exchange 34-year-old Tim Lawrence had joined the royal household from the Navy in 1986. At the seventh attempt, Anne had chosen a man who could be strong, but also knew how to allow a princess her space. His job as equerry was to accompany the Queen on her official engagements and on unofficial engagements to sort of make himself useful in the background. I mean, one of his great skills apparently is mixing a very good martini. And What's interesting is that he got this rule coming from, you know, quite a humble background. He is a man who was born in Camberwell, didn't go to one of the great public schools, wasn't linked to the royal family at all, and certainly wasn't part of the horsey world. Tim really couldn't care less about horses, which of course was something that we've seen in many of Princess Anne's relationships, that they were all equestrians. During his time as equerry, Bachelor Tim had become a great favourite of the Queen and Prince Philip. And obviously, though no one knew it, the Princess Royal herself. But why had Anne fallen for a royal attendant five years her junior? Equerries are chosen as much for their charm and their ability to get on with the royals as they are for any other military disciplines they might have. So in many ways, it kind of came as no surprise that Anne should be attracted to a man like Tim Lawrence. He had echoes of the sort of practical action that she'd found in Peter Cross, and I think that was very appealing. Whilst the palace tried to insist Anne and Tim were nothing more than friends, when news of the letters broke, Tim Lawrence's neighbours gave a different story. They could see her come and they could see her go, but they never told the press about it. They just accepted it. And when the press discovered and rushed down there to talk to it, oh, it's been going on for a long time. She's here nearly every weekend. Anne was having an affair whilst willing to let life pass her by without the support of a loving partner or the joy that comes with having a relationship. She doesn't let societal norms or even royal protocol hold her back. And she's quite modern from that point of view. She's quite sort of forward. The couple's secret was out. And while the Queen apparently gave Tim her full support, Philip was rumored to be less than happy about his employee's betrayal and he wasn't the only one. Anne was still married to Captain Mark Phillips. 
Not one to miss a story, reporters dashed up to Mark and asked him about these letters and what he thought. He found it very embarrassing for him and possibly even humiliating because he wasn't aware of what was going on. While the letter thief was never caught, this revelation sealed the fate of Anne and Mark's marriage. And just months later, in August 1989, they separated. But once again, Anne's reputation emerged intact. It was by then no secret that her marriage to Mark Phillips was not happy, that they were largely staying together for the sake of Peter and Zara. And so I think the public kind of saw this when all these details came out and thought, you know what? We can't blame her for wanting to have a, a bit of happiness. Tim Lawrence wasn't married to someone else. He didn't have a past. He, he was a, such a solid character that it didn't have all the elements of scandal that the papers need. And so I think Anne, Anne got away with it. At the time, Anne was adamant there would be no divorce. Divorce? Very much. Never been mentioned by anybody. But this all changed in 1991, when news of Mark Phillips' love child finally emerged in the Daily Express, accompanied by intimate home footage of Heather and their daughter Felicity, revealing their modest lifestyle. While Mark still denied he was the child's father, a paternity test proved otherwise. He gave Anne a legitimate excuse to get out of the marriage. For that to be splashed across the papers, I think she knew that the public would be on her side, and although divorce was still a bit of a scandal, they very much would have understood that decision. It must have solved a problem that had perhaps been worrying her for quite some time. She may have been the first of the Queen's children to divorce, but the news was overtaken by other much more traumatic events. 1992 is not a year on which I shall look back with undiluted pleasure. Their unhappiness was evident from the moment they arrived. The Waleses, now dubbed the Glums by the tabloid press. The Andrew Morton book on Princess Diana came out, which was absolutely huge. While the royal couple continued to appear in public with their children, the first of a series of... Ferguson, Fergie having her toes sucked, which everybody just went nuts about. It turned out to be an Annus Horribilis. Anne got slightly lost in all of that, and for which I'm sure she'd, she'd be very, very pleased. Only one month after her divorce, Princess Anne and Tim Lawrence were photographed as an official couple for the very first time. That was her own way of controlling the news and revealing to the world through these photographs that she and Tim Lawrence were now an item. It was uh, an exuberant Anne who was photographed dancing Highland flings at a Caledonian ball in central London. Whilst Mark Phillips had been accused of lacking a backbone and Andrew Parker Bowles too wild, Princess Anne had finally found her Mr. Wright in Tim Lawrence, the perfect combination to suit her needs. I think he's the sort of man that Princess Anne was looking for, actually. You know, stable, thorough, reliable, honourable, who would let her take the royal position and he was there, but he didn't seem to be somebody who would be walking way behind, uninvolved and feeling neglected. Tim and Anne were married by the end of the year, and this intimate footage of their wedding, captured by a small film crew, reveals the day was a basic affair, in stark contrast to the pomp and ceremony of her grand nuptials 19 years earlier. It was, on the Princess Royal's insistence, a private family occasion at Cranley Church today, a church just outside Balmain castle and one she's been going to since she was a small child. The princess and Tim went to Scotland to get married because at that time the Church of England refused to marry divorcees again in church and she wanted to get married in church. She would have preferred it of course if there hadn't been a single photographer there. I, I was up there for it. I mean at the time it was characterized as being um, rather joyless. I think that was largely because of the time of year, the weather and the number of guests in contrast to her grand wedding at Westminster Abbey all those years earlier. But I think that's very unfair. It was the wedding that the two of them wanted. I do think Princess Anne has found her true love. She looked genuinely happy. Some people said they haven't seen her look as happy for years and years. At 28 years and counting, Anne now has the second longest running marriage in the royal family. Although her love life has courted controversy at times, she can also boast an unblemished public image. Anne has been shaped by each and every one of her seven relationships, 
all of them influencing the princess royal we know today. I think they show us, in a sense, and journey from this innocent, willful, slightly rebellious girl to the very solid, dutiful woman we have now. Because they were, in a sense, mistakes from which she learned. She's come to quite a strong conclusion about what works for her. She did seek out the sort of love that she wanted, despite many of the constraints that were on her from a young age. I think she's a bit of a beacon for modernity and modern marriages and modern relationships today. the royals, Princess Anne does seem probably one of the happiest, um, ha happily married, very settled, no drama, no impropriety. The marriage spans 28 years, and as this recently revealed cosy, candid photo shows, they're clearly still very happy together. I think a lot of people think that she's always been married to the same person. Anne may be in a stable relationship now, but it's been a long journey to get there. She had a rumoured seven relationships, each different from the last. Princess Anne's past is, to say the least, colourful. I mean, we know that she had seven boyfriends. She was the first royal child to divorce. She married a commoner. She just was rebellious. Some of the boyfriends were considered incredibly unsuitable. This story begins whilst she was still in her youth and perhaps the world's most eligible princess. And when the reported Anne's very first boyfriend, it seemed like a perfect royal match. Gerald Ward was a friend of the royal family, a great friend of Prince Charles. He was regarded as suitable, if you like, by the palace, educated at Eton. The family had uh, land in Wiltshire. But at 12 years older than 18-year-old Anne, what was it about Gerald that really attracted her to him? He was drawn to a good rider, good horseman. Her 